Peril at End House was the first episode of the second season of Agatha Christie's Poirot. This was actually the very first novel that was adapted for this series, and because of that became the series' first feature-length episode. The first season consisted of strictly hour-long adaptations of short stories. I read the novel of Peril at End House for the first time earlier last year, and overall I liked it, but didn't love it. There were a few coincidences that crop up that I wasn't that keen on, but there are some really fun moments, and it has a very good finale. It's very interesting to me that this was chosen as the first novel that they tackled with David Suchet. I'm sure the intention was to do one that nobody else had adapted before, and what resulted is a really wonderful episode. I'm sure I've seen it years ago, but watching it this time actually made me appreciate the novel even more. Because while watching, there are some of those funny moments or interesting scenes that I had pictured a while back while reading being brought to life very accurately. As I've mentioned in the last couple David Suchet reviews, this is again a very faithful adaptation. It was written for television by Clive Exton, who was quite a pivotal writer in the early years of this show. Something that he's very good at is incorporating a great deal of the dialogue from the books into the episodes, and that goes a long way towards me enjoying this show. It seemed to me that a lot of the script is verbatim lines, and if not, it was close enough for me. Again, it's been a little while since I read it. A big reason I was excited to review this episode was the opportunity to talk about two cast members that I haven't had the chance to yet, Captain Hastings and Miss Lemon. Hugh Fraser's Captain Hastings is amazing and was just as perfectly cast as David Suchet was for Poro. He brings this innocence and sense of wonder almost that is so endearing. He's old-fashioned, at least in comparison to Poro, always being taken aback at the attitudes of the younger people around them, and can make the character extremely funny without turning him into a joke. For me, at least, I never feel as though he's being made to appear foolish. He's just a common man that happens to be very good friends with one of the most brilliant and conceited men in the world, so I find myself relating to him. He gets insulted when Poirot belittles him or acts very condescending towards him, and during those moments, I'm completely on Hastings' side. He and David Suchet have such an easy chemistry, and Hugh Fraser knows exactly how to play off of him. And in their scenes, you often get the sense that neither of them is the straight man in terms of the comedy. Both can get laughs, but in different ways. And who else could turn the phrase, I say, into a catchphrase? I love it. Pauline Moran, of course, plays Poirot's long-suffering assistant, Miss Lemon, who is not in the novel, but is always welcome, in my opinion. She turned this character into such an important figure because she is the main woman in Poirot's life, and is very protective of him, and obviously cares a great deal for him. Her Miss Lemon is fiercely professional, organized, and is someone that Poirot can depend on if he decides her help is needed, as he does here. Pauline Moran can play comedy so well too, such as the scene where she and Hastings are sitting around listing the various nicknames that can be spun out of everyday names. The scene has a plot function too, in terms of the mystery, but that doesn't mean it can't be fun. And there's a moment that I thought was so perfect in the way it demonstrates the type of relationship she and Poirot have. Miss Lemon falls asleep on a bench while waiting for Poirot. When he sees this, he pauses, then goes over and gently taps her shoulder, then walks away before she has fully gotten up without a word. And you know he does this because he knows how embarrassed she would be to be caught sleeping on the job. So he gives her the space to compose herself and doesn't mention a thing. It plays out in this simple wide shot, and I thought it was excellent. I've got to talk about David Suchet, he is the star of the show, and the episode features some moments that I would say are just classic Poirot. There's the scene where he has Hastings introduce him, and that he has to pad it out to the appropriately grandiose introduction that he thinks he deserves. I'll surpassed the greatest that ever lived. There's the scene where he rejects his hard-boiled eggs at breakfast because they are not identical in size, and there are the various times where he is obviously annoyed that no one recognizes him. And after watching Death in the Clouds, it was fun seeing him once again suffering through a flight, as the episode opens with he and Hastings flying to their hotel. I believe that scene was not in the book, but I'm glad it was included. The more humor they can stuff in, the better. David Suchet was still in the mode of crafting the icon that his take on the character became, so it's a lot of fun just spending time with the character and reveling in his idiosyncrasies. Philip Jackson's Chief Inspector Jap is somewhat sidelined this time around, and for the longest time it seems like his only function is going to be cutting to him for a quick punchline, which happens several times. Philip Jackson makes the most of these moments, and I always enjoy him. I know I've mentioned this before, but I love those times where they really display how opposite Jap and Poirot are. Take for instance in the last scene, 
this great two shot of them sitting side by side on the beach. Jack is sprawled in a lounge chair wearing his ever present trench coat and fedora while Poirot sits beside him wearing an immaculate white suit and hat. They're very different men, but they make a wonderful team. The rest of the cast is uniformly excellent. We have Polly Walker as Nick Buckley, the girl that Poirot assigns himself to protecting. I realize we're quite a ways into the review, but in case anyone is not aware, the plot follows Poirot and Hastings becoming bodyguards to a young woman who has suffered a series of near-fatal accidents. Nick Buckley is quite the role to take on, being this carefree rich girl that seems to not have a care in the world, and then sees her world change as she's continually under threat. Polly Walker brings all the independence and youthful bravery that this character needs, but then really subtly pivots into vulnerability and fear and beyond. Allison Sterling, too, is very good as Freddy, Nick Buckley's best friend. She's so arrogant and superior and clearly has no use for responsibility or behaving as a proper lady should. When I read the novel, I remember picturing someone quite different, but while watching, I could feel that just disappear because Allison Sterling completely embodies the character. John Harding and Paul Jeffrey star as Commander Challenger and Mr. Lazarus, respectively, rounding out the group of friends with Nick and Freddy, who together have this very worldly, bohemian lifestyle. The two of them don't have quite as much to do as their female co-stars, but again, they are the epitome of shallow playboy types. And finally, I'll mention Jeremy Young and Carol McCready as Mr. and Mrs. Croft, an Australian couple that live very close to End House, where Nick Buckley lives. Carol McCready doesn't have a lot to do, only appearing in a couple of scenes, but Jeremy Young is appropriately over the top as this over-friendly, blustery man. Poirot has them pegged pretty quickly, and so do we. They're working some angle, but it takes some time to figure out what that is. The story is an interesting one, in part because of how Poirot is brought into the case, if you can call it that. There's an element that I believe was focused on more in the book, where Hastings thinks Poirot has so quickly offered his services to young Miss Buckley because he's smitten with her. That's mentioned offhandedly in this episode as well, and we're not quite sure if that's the case. Poirot is quick to dismiss the suggestion, but Nick Buckley is very friendly to him, and Poirot does enjoy flattering the ladies, so who knows? Plunging into a case this way could account for some of the missteps that Poirot takes, and shows him to be not quite as perfect as he would like to think. The entire ending was fantastic, with the fake seance and putting Miss Lemon on the spot to portray a medium. Pauline Moran plays that scene so well, really becoming a deer in the headlights before settling into the part that Poirot has just cast her in. And the reveal all was great. Anytime that David Suchet gets to play an angry Poirot, shooting down suspects that would dare lie to Poirot's face, automatically elevates an episode for me. And the last scene, where our four main characters are all together on the beach, was everything you want in an ending. They're joking around about ice cream, Poirot makes a face at what apparently was not the flavor he was expecting, and we fade to the credits. That's what made these early seasons so great to me, that camaraderie that these characters shared. Scenes like this one almost feel like they could fit at the end of a sitcom episode, with the cast hanging out, kicking back, and we fade to black. It's so different from a deadly serious murder mystery, and it cements this as the feel-good type of show that Poirot could be. Quickly, I just have to mention the locations and the costumes. The costumes were by Linda Maddock, who was responsible for a dozen episodes over the first three Poirot seasons. The detail and look of this show are so important, and I love Poirot's white ensemble that I mentioned before, and Hastings' travel outfits are great, with lots of loud striped jackets. The episode was filmed in Salcombe, Devon, which is actually near Torquay, Agatha Christie's hometown. I love the scenery with the beaches and this beautiful rocky pathway down to them. The hotel where Poirot and Hastings stay is also really picturesque. And End House itself. Somehow they managed to find a house that was exactly what I pictured when I was reading. It's this huge rambling manor, and the interiors are perfect. The walls are so aged, and look like what you'd expect a house that's been passed down through generations would look like. And the same thing with the Croft House. It's smaller, more of a cottage, and the wood-paneled look, but also very open and bright, again brought me straight back to what I'd read. The location scouts definitely earned their money this time. Who am I kidding? They always do on this show. So, if you're looking for an ideal Poirot episode to revisit, I highly recommend Peril at End House. For me, it was everything I hoped for when I sit down to spend time with the illustrious, brilliant Hercule Poirot. My friend, is that all you can find to say? Mais dis donc, say then to mademoiselle that I am the detective unique. Thanks so much for watching my review. If you enjoyed it, please check back to Hildebrand Productions as I'll have more reviews coming shortly. Adios for now.